time once again for the post prison education program radio show and we are joined here live in the kodx studios once again by ari Cohn, who is president and founder of the post prison education program and uh, ari thank you for coming in once again yep you're like, like, like clockwork you are the rock that is keeping us going <laughs> 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 so um, so it is, uh, it has been another, um, interesting month, uh, for many reasons. One, as you had mentioned at least last on last month's uh, show, if, and I think you also mentioned it perhaps on a show, uh, the month even prior to that, but, um, post prison education program is celebrating 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty so cool. That's, um, um, can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, Hannah set up a, a newsletter to our listserv that went out last Sunday, and I think uh, I think we got it up on our Facebook page, so I think there's a link to it uh, on the program's Facebook page to the newsletter that talks about it. But it was, uh, you know, Taylor Buck... Um, has Kevin Allen, who, Taylor is our, the, our team leader for applicant and student services, and she has, um, Taylor has Kevin Allen on a panel, a, a nationwide panel with Na NAMI, which I, we're really excited about, and it's super important, uh, in October. And they were asking me, about my history with Kevin. And, and you know, my, my Outlook archives are pretty extensive. I, I mean, I archive stuff sort of notoriously. And, and, and Outlook being the uh, <coughs> Microsoft email system. Yeah, okay. so, uh, uh, so I, went, I went back. I, I mean, so I, anyway, I had forgotten a lot I mean, I vaguely remembered 2005 um, when when the whole conversation about the program started, but I had forgotten a lot of the specifics, and uh, so I searched my outlook and uh, and and found all these email from 2005 that uh, between Kevin and I. Uh, where he was introducing me to a professor named Fer Dario, who introduced me to Emil Petrie, who was uh, vice president of the Office of Minority Affairs at the University of Washington, and um, so it was it was just it was kind of you know it was nice I, or it was interesting anyway. It was just because I'd forgotten so much of it, and so well, Hannah was for this newsletter announcing, that went out to the listserv announcing the 15th anniversary, she wanted me to write a, an introductory paragraph or two about the last 15 years. And so I used some of those email that I went and found for Taylor so she would have a good bio for Kevin um, and use that to kind of talk about um, how the program got started. It was really a fluke. Like we, we've got uh, somebody that works with us who's a Princeton graduate, Crystal, and, and just took her LSAT today. And I was kind of in that mode, but I had graduated UW and had, had taken LSAT and was headed for law school. I'd actually flown to Florida and interviewed one law school down there that I liked because they were in the top 10 in litigation. It was a little teeny tiny law school, Stetson University, but they always beat Harvard and all these big name schools in national competitions for litigation, civil rights litigation. So I, I had applied there and I was invited for an interview. And then there was another comparable school in Sacramento. And, and uh, so I was doing that I, and I had and interviewed at a law school in Philadelphia. And, and so I was headed for law school, and a professor 
a block away from here. What, the University of Washington School of Social Works, a block north or a block south? Block south. South. Yeah, and um, she knew me and she knew my politics. And, and um, she suggested I go to this sort of welcome home party for um, two women and three men coming out of Washington's prison system back to the community. And it, it, it's back then I used to uh, mentor, I was a big brother to several young people and big brothers, big sisters, right? And, and, my, and so my Saturday, that Saturday was, my Saturday was, was with this young man and, and I didn't want to break that commitment, but I wanted to go to this welcome home party and then I went. And Kevin Allen was one of the people um, that coming out of prison. And, and what got me was, you know, there's such a stigma about mental illness. It's, I don't think, other than having a, a history of sex crimes, I don't think there's any, you know, like if you murder somebody, there's no stigma to that at all. Go to prison, do your time, come out, and you can put your life back together. But there's such a stigma about people who suffer mental illness that when I see somebody be courageous to the max, that they're willing to talk publicly about their diagnosis, um, it always gets my attention. And, and Kevin was just, that day those, those men and women could speak or not speak, right? And they weren't gonna get much of towels, dental floss, you know, just kind of a welcome home thing. And it was at Pocan. Uh, when Pocan was in like the 2300 block on South Rainier and he just spoke eloquently and he very candidly about I think back then they were still calling bipolar manic depressive which I think by far is a better description but he spoke about that diagnosis and addiction to crack and I was just blown away and uh, I mean, he was. He, 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 Kevin was on the show with us. Remember, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of months ago, and back pre-COVID, when people could come down here to the station without risking their lives, and and um, and you know, he's just eloquent and compassionate and loving and soft-spoken and spoken and and speaks really well, and um, and he just blew me away. So I I worked with the nonprofit that did the event that day and made arrangements to take him to breakfast. And he was staying at the low high end, uh, back then. And, uh, so I picked him up at the low high end. We went to Julia's kitchen on Capitol Hill and I looked for two hours. I listened to him talk and I just, I had just finished four years. It, UW and so my mind was really oriented towards education and I uh, and I, th I I really thought somebody that was had comorbidity in their life you know addiction and mental illness probably I mean there's a good chance they couldn't put their lives together Kevin has by the way which is extraordinary and um, um, but I thought if anything could, it would be getting him on a college campus. And so I, um, I met him, uh, listened to him, um, wrote Mike McCann. I think I've talked about this before at UW, who was running the Law Society and Justice program at the time, which he founded, and asked McCann if he would... Uh, um, if he would support a program that helped people like Kevin get into college. And at the time, I was just thinking about getting people into UW. I mean, I probably, I'd only been in Washington State five years. I probably didn't even know there was a town called Walla Walla. I, I think I remotely knew there was a Spokane. But, you know, like Wenatchee or all these places that have wonderful schools, I didn't know anything about them. So I was just thinking... Um, about UW really, and Mike McCann was super responsive, and then 
Robin Hennis, uh, who's still at admissions at UW, again, a couple blocks from here, Smith's Hall, although I'm sure she's not, I'm guessing she's not coming in. And, uh, um, uh, and Mike and Robin was super supportive. And so we had a lunch at the UW Faculty Club. That's what it was back then. Now it's and decided to start the program. And somewhere right about then, Kevin was telling me about the resident release program, which put prisoners, instead of going to work release like they do now if they're lucky, uh, they, uh, prisoners would come out to the dorms at, at the University of Washington on the campus and be actually prisoners in this resident release program. And, uh, and Kevin told me some of the names that had been really life-changing for him. Woody Hodge, who I recently retired, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, Fur Dario, and, 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 uh, and, the, and, and the guy who ran the resident release program, I forget the, his name, but uh, and then the, the key thing, I mean, the key thing was, uh, was uh, Fur Dario gave me several names. And one of, one of the names w was somebody who worked at the uh, Office of Minority Affairs. And so I went over to Smith's Hall to, to OMA, and this guy, uh, I don't know whether he thought, like, looked at me and and I and decided that I was wacko or or I'm a former prisoner and 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 it was a you know kind of something a, a fad and I'd forget about it in two weeks or something like that and uh, but he didn't have time for it he was too too busy but he recommended me to the next office down the hall which was Emil Petrie and Emil is like you know in this town I, there are a few icons, and and Emil certainly has to be one of them. Um, some people would say Larry Gossett is has 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 been iconic in our history. Yeah, but and and Emil and Larry know each other, and and go, they they were in the group. Um, the uh, UW actually made a movie of Emil and Larry and. Uh, when there was no black student group at the University of Washington, uh, and and uh, I think Evans was governor, and these few black students took over the president's office at the University of Washington. They actually drove a bulldozer in, in, into a construction hall, <laughs> did all these wonderful things, right? And I think Evans was going to call out the National Guard, but decided not to. And, and, and out of that, they ended up with a black student group. And, and uh, extraordinarily uh, ended up with a, a, a center, a learning center, that's just a, a couple blocks from Smith's Hall, so a couple blocks from where we're sitting. That if you were, and it was oriented to um, tutoring or working with people of color, but, but a white person could go in. If you were a student, and you were having trouble with astronomy or physics or whatever, except for like Christmas Eve night or something, a couple nights a year, you could go into that place at three in the morning in a panic because you got a test the next day, and there'd be a PhD graduate student who was a brainiac there to 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 coach you, right? And so that came out of Emil's uh, activism when he was much younger than he is now. So he, he retired a couple of years ago. And, uh, 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 but I, uh, anyway, uh, Emil was immediately on board. And, and so we started the, uh, we started the planning, um, for the program in August, August 23rd, 2005. And then finally, March 29, 2006, there was a, a, a meeting of 29 people. By then, we had a 29-person working committee, and there was a meeting at the University of Washington School of Law. 
and um, and Emil was there. Robin Hennis was there. Eileen Robeson, who was in financial aid, was there. Uh, Roger Goodman, who I wouldn't give you two cents for now, was there. And and uh, just uh, Hong Tran was instrumental that day. She's to this day a felony defense attorney with the, the Defender Association Division of King County. And uh, and we voted, 29 people voted to unanimously to start the program, it, it, to incorporate it and seek tax exempt status. But And Emil agreed to be the first chair of our board. And I, you know, there's always a funny story that uh, his office used to be, OMA used to be in Smith's Hall, now it's in Mary Gates. And 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 I every once in a while I would come out from our office in the central building and Emil and I would go to lunch. And the first time we ever did it, so we're walking from Smith's Hall to the UW Faculty Club, right? Which later became the University of Washington Club. And it used to take us an hour to get from his office to the faculty club because every other person we passed was grateful to Emil for something that he had done for them during their, you know, during their college years. I mean, really, it was, I thought I was walking with the Buddha or something, right, or, or, or Zeus or God knows who, but it's like everybody worshipped him and, and, and loved him. And then you'd, then you'd finally make it to the faculty club and get, get seated, and you couldn't eat because people kept coming by the table. Um, it'd be like, Almost like in the old in the old days when Eldon Vale was secretary of the DOC, he and I had this fabulous back hole restaurant in Olympia, and we'd have to go to the back room because he was the secretary of the DOC. And if we sat out in the main room, then everybody would be coming by the table, and you couldn't eat. And um, and it was so it was kind of like that with a meal, except for there was no back room that he and I could hide out in. And so it's just like one person after another coming by and paying their respects and expressing gratitude so um but uh, emil that day i can picture it and I, he, he we asked him to be the initial chair and he agreed and he stood up and he spoke and everything coalesced and and that's how the program started and uh so it was uh you know there was people along the way like if mike mccann had responded negatively to my email to him after i met kevin allen um, I probably would have quit. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, you know, gone to Robin Hennis if I got a really negative response, like, oh, this will never work. I did, his response was, this is going to be very difficult, but let's do it. But, and boy, was he right. Uh, but, um, uh, or if for Dario had never given me a meals, you know, had never directed me to the office of minority affairs, um, uh, or really, you know, there was some hesitation during that March 29th, 2006 meeting about incorporating and, and seeking tax exempt status, and Hong Tran spoke up um, and, and carried the day. And so there was people all along the way that if they had been negative instead of positive, there'd be no post prison education program, and uh, Kevin Allen at the head of the list. So. So anyway, that was, so August 23rd, 2005 was a big deal as far as I'm concerned. It was with, with a lot of, a lot of memories. So we, so that, the, the, the thing that, uh, the newsletter that Hannah put together, that does have an introductory paragraph for me, that, that's on our Facebook page, and uh, she's on personal leave for another week or two due to some real sadness uh, in our family and um, when that'll end up on it's in the blog section of our website and and there's some great links one of the one of the links um, is to an interview with uh, Jarvis J Masters who's on death row it's San Quentin and I think I may have talked about this last time, and I don't know if the interview had happened yet or what. no. It was going to. It was a week away. Yeah. So what you know was really so it's that's happened. That was extraordinary uh, to be able to talk to somebody 
who has been locked up in San Quentin for 40 years and, and is done with his life what he's done with it, but it was like, so that's, uh, there's a link to that interview uh, also in that newsletter. And, um, um, y- you know, the, it was pretty extraordinary. I, David Sheff um, is a famous author now. I, I, I think he became famous he might have been well known and respected before he wrote Beautiful Boy, but when he wrote Beautiful Boy ten years ago, and then when it became a movie, Amazon Studios turned it into a, a huge movie success in 2018. Then David became really famous, and um, um, and out, out of the blue, Weir Harmon, who's been the director of Town Hall since Town Hall came into existence, I think. I think Weir was there when Paul Allen was putting up the bucks and they were putting the whole thing together. I think he's the original director, but Weir sent an email to me asking me if I would agree to interview David Sheff. And, and I was like instantly, oh, hell yes. I think all I did was hit reply all and put yes, three exclamation marks uh, because I had read Beautiful Boy and I had seen the movie, at which you can still, you can Netflix Beautiful Boy. It's, 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 it's the story... Of, of David's son uh, becoming addicted to meth, and and uh, and and in the battle, um, it was a ten-year battle to save Nick's life, and and uh, and you know I told one of the cool one of the, two of the really most amazing people I've met in the last couple of years, Pete Early who wrote Crazy, who we had a town hall last October, and, and then David Sheff has something very much in common. They're not quitters. And, they, and, and, and them not quitting saved their son's life. But both of their sons are doing well because Pete didn't quit on his son and David didn't quit on his son. And, and so... so I, when we wrote, and I, I, uh, um, and, and asked if I do that interview, I was like honored, number one, and I was ecstatic, number two. And then I hadn't read Buddhist on Death Row, and then they wanted me to use earphones, which I never use. I answer most phone calls. I answer on computers now. I don't hardly ever answer. Everything is WebEx in our world. WebEx meetings. WebEx teams webex calling but i you know i talked through the computer and 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 but i had fortunately this brand new pair of cisco earphones and so we so i read the book reread the book was blown away and then we did a a tech call with town town hall has amazing amazing staff and uh and so we did a tech check, kind of a call with David and is, is near San Francisco and, and me at Green Lake. And, and town hall people spread, you know, also working from home and, and, and not in their building. And, and so David and I got to talk that day. And then 30 minutes before we went live on this crowdcast, uh, we, town hall had David and I in what they call the green room. So, uh, all they had to do was click a button and we'd be live, but we were in the green room and we were able to talk for a half hour with Weir and and Candace and um, and so I during that time I told him that that what he had done with his son and beautiful boy just reminded me so much of Pete Early uh, with with his son and 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 I the last paragraph of Pete's book Crazy just is just a heartbreaking phenomenal. I love it. He's got this, he goes through truths that he's learned. And the third truth was that basically you'll never, you'll, you'll never quit. And so, uh, that, that, that I'll always be there for you, which to the greatest extent possible is, is, a, a moral rule of the post-prison education program. I mean, there are things that applicants and students can do that will cause us to close the file. 
Uh, but uh, but to the extent that funding allows and and uh, and and we're, we're, that's our that's our sort of motto or that's our the rule we try to live by you know we we'll, we're here for you you know relapse we're still here psychotic breakdown we're still here uh, have a something bad happen and your grades go to hell we're still here drop out of school we're still here you know uh, so there's that truth in Pete's book that I've always admired and, and it's in, and he and David have that in common, which is kind of extraordinary because they're both really well-known authors. So anyway, so August 23rd, two Sundays ago, was our 15th anniversary and, and the newsletter is on the Facebook page and uh, it's really worth re reading. Uh, you know, if for no, Hannah's built a brand new website and the link to that's there. Um, and then uh, the, 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 the town hall YouTube of the Crowdcast where I interviewed David and Jarvis is, that link is there. And it's just, it's amazing. It's, it, it, it's you know, there's, it's amazing what, to have a, 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 somebody be able to call in from death row and you know, and 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 talk to us, and 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 people were able to put a chat up, chat do uh, questions up at the end, which was really cool. So it could be, so Jarvis couldn't see those. David and I could see them, and Candace from Town Hall could see them, and T Candace is the one who was putting them up. Uh, but we could read them to Jarvis, and uh, a couple of them were just tear jerking. I, I was like, there was uh, one that two that I read to him that reading them brought me to tears and then but uh it was it was really extraordinary and that 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 uh you know the the state of California that's supposed to be liberal and the governor who's supposed to be progressive has allowed this man who absolutely everyone knows is innocent to be on death row for all these years is is it's an outrage so it's a it's a really good interview and 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 I uh, I was honored really really um, to be invited to do that and uh, David Chef is a, uh, just a s sweetheart loving guy and fabulous writer and Jarvis the same and so that that's in that newsletter and so we're on to the next fifteen. And I think the good news, you know, I put it um, in the newsletter for the first time um, in in these 15 years. I think the nonprofit is is at a place where I could die tomorrow and the program could survive. I mean, funders would have to stay get behind our current staff, but we've got. really amazing people in the office now you know uh, and and uh, and I name I named them in the newsletter so that's cool and you know not wanting to be optimistic and not be through an entire interview on your show Mike I'm going to switch over <laughs> so, <laughs> so, something that's very much on my I'm, mind okay I'm surprised <laughs> the shift didn't come a little sooner <laughs> So um, I wish I could name this guy um, so everybody could track him as he releases from the Department of Corrections. But there's a guy at the prison at Airway Heights who's returned to prison seven times. And... Um, on felony cases. I don't know how many misdemeanor cases he have. We, we have DOC data uploaded uh, into our sales force and, and so we can see in incarceration events for his record, we can see how his first incarceration was 1995. It's really sets the life. For 25 years this guy has been in and out of prison and it's all about mental illness. So we, we spend a lot of time 
in in email from from prisoners uh, and and uh, J- JPay, which is another one of these goddamn for profit companies taking advantage of of prisoners and uh, and their families and their families exactly. And uh, you know, so GTL, Securus, JPay, um, I'm fine if somebody drops a nuclear bomb on their corporate headquarters. I might be dancing in the street with my first tequila since 1984. But anyway, we're, we are uh, constantly in, in JPay with prisoners. And this guy, as he's gotten closer to his release, um, has gotten really frantic. There's no other word, frantic about getting us to to be involved with him uh, and and to work for him when he releases. And the email, the JPay are psychotic. I mean, that's all. There's you can. It, 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 it's just obvious. It, so um, Taylor is receiving JPay from him. Lila is receiving more JPay than than Taylor or I receive, but we're all three receiving tons of just desperate JPay from him. And there's like that he's not in touch with reality or um, he's got such difficult issues, mental health issues that his mind's just all over the place. So one day it's I want to release to Moses Lake. It's the next day if I release to Moses Lake, I'll obviously return to prison because every crime I ever had happened there and every bad thing happened there and every relapse happened. And, and one day it'll be, I just need a job. The next day it'll be, I, need, I, I want to get into school. And, 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 and the, the differences are stark. And I've never done this before, but things were so bad. It was so clear in our office, and it is so clear in our office, that, that this guy needs help and probably ne- needs to be on meds. That uh, I reviewed all of his email to Taylor, all the ones that he's written to Lila, and all the ones he's written to me, and then I spent a couple days drafting a response. And we put it up in Google Docs, and we were very careful with it, and then we dropped it into a JPEG and sent it to him. And, and then I sent a copy of that to the superintendent of the prison, James Key, and to Danielle Armbruster, who's assistant secretary in charge of reentry, um, and, and several other people in leadership at the Department of Corrections asking, just letting him know this is where we're at with this guy and and we think he needs to be evaluated. So it it was really, we'll see how this plays out and I'm going to track it and if it plays out the way I think, I'm going to do everything I can to get it on the front page of a newspaper. But so what they did was... uh, they called this guy in for an evaluation. And, and you know, if you're going to be evaluated for schizoaffective disorder, which is not what I think his diagnosis is, I think his diagnosis is either bipolar or borderline personality, but I'm not a, a mental health professional. But we've, we've sent his email to a mental health professional, and, and she was the one that suggested that, he be evalu- that we ask to have him evaluated. And... Uh, but I, you can't do an evaluation as to whether somebody is suffering borderline personality disorder or um, bipolar in what you know walk into a medical room in a prison with somebody who's probably not qualified. Answer a few questions. You know, did you rob the bank? No, 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 I didn't. I didn't rob. Them. Are you mentally ill? Hell, no, I'm not mentally ill. You know. Um, do you have any mental health? Oh no. Do you use drugs? No, never. You know, that, you know, you can't, that, that's pretty much how I think the evaluation went. And I'm guessing it was made by somebody and guessing is emphasis that it was made by somebody who, um, isn't qualified. And, um, um, 
but we really quickly, like within a day, got an email back for the superintendent saying we, we've had him evaluated. It didn't say what the outcome was, but then the next thing we get is angry JPay from the prisoner. So it's clear that DOC was like probably was probably like the post prison education program ratted you out and asked for this evaluation, you know, and 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 so we've gotten way lengthy JPay from him, insisting he doesn't need to be on pills. You know, basically saying, well, now I know what you think of me, because he'd been told by DOC staff that we, we suggested the evaluation based on recommendation from a medical mental health provider who I really respect and know extremely well. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and then again, begging for help. And so, so he's, anyway, he's gonna release between now and November 10th He's going, to, he's going to release to his county of origin, which is just insane, Moses Lake. And, and um, I, I don't care what you say. If there's one person that lives in Moses Lake that's not a Donald Trump supporter, I'd probably be, I'd be surprised. But that's a conservative Republican, what I call a hater community. And there's no support there for a guy like this. And what's going to happen, again, is what's happened in the past. So, I mean, if, if DOC had acted responsibly to the letter we sent to them, they would have done a county of origin change and let him release to anywhere other than Moses Lake. And they would have made sure he releases to somewhere like Spokane or Seattle where there's mental health uh, providers that would give this guy a chance. But what's going to happen is we're, we're not, we're, we're going to try to, we're comp it's really sad, and I feel bad about it. He is not on meds and not with mental health care providers involved. He's beyond our ability to help. You know, we can't successfully work for somebody that one day is going in this direction, the next day is work going in another direction. Um, and uh, and so we're, work we're composing a, a kinder, kind as gentle uh, of, of a jpay as we can to let him know that we just that we can't that we're not going to be involved mm -hmm. you know that we can't that we that that uh i think that's going to go out tomorrow and so so you know what's what's going to happen is you know he's going to come out and he's going to catch a new case and he's going to continue this life of incarceration because this goddamn society from Jay Inslee on down and Steve Sinclair and, 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 and Danielle Armbruster, who I talk to fairly regularly, the, the assistant secretary of, uh, in charge of reentry, and right on down to the superintendent and, and right on down to the guy's counselor, they're, re, re, they're doing nothing, nothing to prepare this guy for a successful release. And he won't have a successful release. And we're, we're you know, we're not an entitlement. We're not DSHS. We don't have a multi-billion dollar budget. Uh, I'm not Cheryl Strange. I can't de have dedicate staff to work for this guy. We don't, we don't. And, 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 and so I think it's going to be a horrible outcome. And the responsibility for that is at the feet of people who don't give a goddamn. And again, that's Inslee and Catherine Levers and Sonia Hallam and, and apparently Danielle Armbruster and, the, and James Key and everybody at Airway Heights who's working with this guy. And then everybody who's in Moses Lake where he'll release to. It's just, and we're seeing, we just see this a lot. And, and I've been seeing it for 15 years. And, and so like the turmoil in, in our office right now is, is that, I mean, we actually had lunch. We went to lunch yesterday yesterday. Uh, I just had a surgery Tuesday that was horrible, and I was f feeling really bad yesterday. And but the concern level for this guy was so great that I agreed to meet Lila and Taylor to talk this out. And um, and so it's just that the 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 the. the 
normally we dive in. We're, normally we make commitments thinking maybe we can pull this out of our ass somehow, some way. Um, and most often we do, miraculously. Uh, but this one is one where we just feel like there's no chance of us of us being able to work for him in a way where he can be successful. So we're, we're backing out and we're going to leave it to DOC and their community corrections officers who work for Mac Peavy, who I despise since he lied to me in a matter involving Wendy Hine. And, um, and we'll see what happens. And, uh, you know, we'll follow it closely. So I don't know. And just to be clear for people that might not be familiar, um, your organization regularly works with people that are coming out of prison that have mental health issues. If yeah. That, you, you appear to gravitate exactly towards that, the people, yeah. the most challenging yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, one of the things that Crystal Lou is doing for us is, um, is taking our data and pulling it out of Salesforce uh, and DOC records that we have and putting it into Tableau software, which paints pretty pictures. So it's, it's super accurate, but it's, you know, for, for a lot of people to look at a spreadsheet with all this data and stuff is, is numbers and data and, you know, but if you put it in a really pretty bar graph, which Tableau software is really good at, it make, make really nice narratives out of data, and then it just makes it more clear. So, so Crystal has confirmed what we already knew, and it's what you just said. It's we, we uh, I think, and I think I've talked about it on the program before, it's, uh, you know, we, since 2010, we have, by choice, uh, gravitated towards people who suffer mental illness. And that was when it became clear through DOC data that maybe half of Washington's prisoners su are, are, are designated by the DOC as have, suffering serious mental illness. We've criminalized mental illness. W like it or not, if you're okay with that, you're a hater, and I wish you dead, really. But And if you're if you're... If you're aware of it and you're not doing anything to fix it, then I wish you dead. Ensley, you at the head of the list uh, because he has the power. I mean, to, to take p people who are born into poverty and suffer mental illness, to allow them to spend decades of their life in misery is so unconscionably wrong that I can't even put words to it. And, and so, but, so when we encountered this DNC, DOC data, starting in 2010 uh, then and I talked about it at town hall last October 9th and that's the reason we had Peter early in from Washington DC for that event was to talk about mental. then we started gravitating towards not helping anybody who's mentally healthy and helping only people who suffer mental illness um, and uh, and so f as of the 2016, study by UW as to the efficacy of the program, um, I think it was 74.2% point, of our applicants, so people who apply to the program, uh, have been designated by the Department of Corrections as being high risk to recidivate. So that's an admissions criteria. And then once they get through the acceptance process that we have, it turns out that it's a larger percentage of people that we actually accept. So 78% of our actual students, as opposed to 74% of our applicants, are rated by the DOC as high risk to, to recidivate, not low, not moderate. Um, and then 48%, it could be 43, and I've forgotten, but I think it's 48% of that 78% our S code two, three, four, or five, which is the DOC designation for serious mental illness. And so we do, that is where we're at and nobody's there, but us. And I'm thrilled that we're there. Um, I wish that a hundred percent of the people we work with are, were 
high risk to recidivate, and 100% of them were also S code 2, 3, 4, or 5, suffering serious mental illness. And uh, then I would be happy. Our, our recidivism, our students' rate of recidivism would presumably go down, but that's a choice that funders have. So when, 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 when Rake's Foundation says, oh, we're only going to work with kids, we, by policy, we won't work with, we won't fund entities working for adult former prisoners. Same thing for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I won't even go there, you know. Um, and it, 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 or, you know, all, all these, all these F Seattle Foundation, if you ask Seattle Foundation to fund, um, Seal Erickson, I hope you're listening. I love you, but your your foundation sucks. Uh, you know, uh, you know, if you ask them to fund in meaningful dollars, uh, helping adult former prisoners who most often have children, by the way, um, that are suffering serious mental illness or not, they're a no show. They're not going to show up, and they're not going to help. So. Uh, Pending, I mean, it, if we had really substantial, meaningful funding, maybe our student success rate, which is 92.13%, spectacular, wouldn't go down. But presumably, if we were 100% working with people with a high risk to recidivate high, high, and 100% of them suffering mental illness, it would go down somewhat. But Maybe, maybe it would go from 92% to 80%. And so maybe eight out of 10 people that didn't have a chance but for us would have a life and really a good life. Um, so, uh, you know, you're right. We, we are, that's where we're at. And we're there by choice. And uh, I don't know what else to say about that. I, I, you know, I'm really, when I watch government, and, you know, a superintendent at the Department of Corrections, that's government because the, se the secretary of the DOC is head of a state agency on the governor's cabinet. That's government. Right, da right down to this guy's counselor, that's government. So when government responds as poorless, poorly as they do um, to great need, I'm a, I, and we see it every day, I'm hopeless. You know, we've got a guy that just came out of prison after nine years for a violation, a failed piss test, nine years for a violation. Um, and, uh, and his CCO, who's at the DOC's West Seattle office, won't allow him to have a cell phone and won't allow him to have Internet access. So Taylor's group has him registered to go to Bellevue College. And he would do extremely well there, but he can't go to school as it stands right now because the Department of Corrections won't allow him to have Internet access. Will not. So, you know, a, a lawyer now will take that back to the sentencing judge and try to get that changed. And maybe that will happen in time for him to start school this quarter, and maybe it won't. Um, but for right now, and, and, and I called Danielle about this. She was actually on vacation in Montana and, and sent her an email saying, I want to talk, and we ended up talking about a week ago. And I went through the entire history of this, and, and then I wrote her a confirming email asking her to do what was necessary to reverse the action by the CCO out at the West Seattle office, and I haven't heard from her since, not one peep. I didn't get a no, and I haven't got a yes, but you know, actions speak louder than words, and, and this this young man can't use the internet, so he can't work in our office. We were going to have him in our office on work study because he would be fabulous, coaching on people people coming out of prison, what to do, what not to do, how to succeed, how not to succeed, um, and and uh, um, so we can't have him in our office because we're we're internet up to our ears, and uh, and he can't can't do classes with Bellevue College because that's all remote internet. Uh, so they block, and you know, really, you can't, 
you cannot do anything in today's society without a smartphone and, uh, and internet access. You can't. You can't buy a plane ticket. You can't get a lift. You can't order groceries. You can't apply for jobs. And it's been amplified by the pandemic. It's, it's, it's like amplified a million times over. And, and, and so what the CCO is doing is, is making certain this young man can't do anything but not put his life back together again. That's outrageous. It's outrageous. And I, we just see it every day. It's, that's, that's, that's what we do. That's what Taylor's group does. That's what Applicant Student Services, a post-prison education program does, is, is, is try to counter just horrible circumstances like we've been talking about in the last 20 minutes. I mean, and, and I got, I'm hopeless. I'm, I have no hope that it's, it's going to get better. I mean, um, uh, it amazed me walking in here today to see this major construction on the street between here and UW bookstore. So, because it just, that's, you know, Durkin and Inslee and Dow Constantine and his little dilettante fancy shoes. They all, um, they can talk about, oh, there's no money for that. We'd love to take care of people who are homeless, suffering mental illness, but we have no money. It's not in the budget. The dollars aren't there. But they got the dollars to make wealthy people wealthier. And there's all these crazy construction programs going on. The bridge on Lander from 6th Avenue, where our office is, to 1st, where Starbucks headquarters is, has to have cost hundreds of millions of dollars. There was money for that. And it's just rich. The people who sell concrete, they're getting richer. Steel, they're getting richer. The, pe you know, the wealthy are getting wealthier. And, and, and people that are suffering are the level that they're suffering at is increasing. But there's, there's money to have this out here on this street construction. Major construction in front of my house on East Green Lake Way. There's money for all of that, but there's not money to take care of, of people and meet what I think is a societal obligation, you know? And, and I, I just wonder where all these people who have, like, no morals, no ethics, where they came from. You know, they're just, like, egocentric and I really want to use the F word, but I won't, I, you know. But consider it having just been said. All these egocentric, you fill in the blank with an S on the end and an F on the front. And, 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 they, and they just seem to be everywhere, you know. And, and it's, uh, so I don't know. I, I, it's not going to get better. I'm glad I'm 73 and one year closer to being in a box pushing up daisies out in North Seattle somewhere because I don't want to see where this is going. It's miserable. It's too bad. It's, um, I told Taylor the other day I, I would hate to be her age because, you know, so she's 30 and life expectancy for female is 88. So, you know, she could have to watch this world disintegrate in the ways that it's disintegrating for 50 more years plus eight. I mean, I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear it. You know, um, I get, so I don't know. Ask me a question. Change the subject. <laughs> D despite all the hurdles that um, your organization and everyone else is, is facing, you continue to, in your struggle, do amazing work. I mean, it's still a, uh, 15 years is still a, a major celebration of the amazing work that your organization has done. I mean, the, the people, just the few people um, that I've seen come through your organization and had the good fortune to meet and stuff are, are amazing stories. Yeah. I mean, uh, just mind blowing. <laughs> or um, so many folks who, you know, um, on those times when I'm thinking, oh, I, this is, you know, my particular life is really tough on me. And then you look at people that have gone through your program that, that are absolutely inspiring. Yeah. And then you can look at people in government who've met them and, and know, as a matter of fact, what can be done at much less cost than what they're doing, than what they're doing now. And just because of, you know, legislative cowardice, political expediency, just won't, just won't. Um, and 
um, you know, when the UW study of our work was completed in 2016, there were 176 people that, that fit what you just described uh, that, that had been students of ours. One hundred and so it's not a small number, 176 lives as of four years ago. And right now we're working with almost more people than we've ever worked with before. The highest number we ever had at, at level of service three was, was 53, where we're spending big bucks on you know, heavily involved in somebody's life, paying out lots of money every month. And we're right at 50 right now. I mean, uh, uh, so, uh, but 176 is, is, is a consequential number, and that was as of four years ago, and 92.13% of them were successful. And 78% of them, you know, had been rated by the DOC as high risk. And, and, and again, 48% of that 78% were, were suffering serious mental illness. And, uh, and, and, you know, so they, but they just won't, they won't fund it, you know. So it's just like, every, you know, every once in a while we're just, um, this program has almost made me believe in God. <laughs> Don't piss off everybody, but, you know, um, it, it, because, because every time I think we can't survive the next day for one funding issue or next, we do. And it's because some caring person steps in and, a, you know, a $20,000 check from a Googler or a $50,000 wire transfer from a Googler um, or a $16,000 loan from somebody who's sat here in this in this studio before because she knows us through her, her nephew who's deceased now. Uh, but something, or a, an un, unexpected grant, you know, will we'll pop it, show up in the door and, um, and we'll, we'll survive, you know. So sometimes, sometimes I think God's strategy is to just torture the hell out of me and everybody associated with me that thinks the way I do, but not let the program go under because <laughs> she keeps saving it <laughs> it's like it's just it's just crazy so um we've got a f fabulous development director uh and if you click on the link in the newsletter so hannah put up three of the staff members bios me and and taylor and lila but there's a link to click through to the rest so you can see crystal and and caitlin and uh, and Hannah herself and 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 uh, Caitlin Lombardi uh, was at ACLU Washington for eleven years and 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 then and really knows what she's doing and so we're we have some really large grant applications out on the, the million dollar range and um, and we're hopeful. And she's putting out really uh, amazing work, you know. And 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 if half of those are successful, then um, then all the Roger Goodmans and Tim Ornsby's be damned. We'll survive and we'll keep doing it. And someday we'll take the data and shove it up there. Can I say that? Probably not. Shove it up their ass. <laughs> so find out. <laughs> so, all right. My uh, lawyers will be talking to your lawyers. <laughs> we have plenty. Yeah. It's good because we don't have any. All right. Uh, we are just about out of time talking with Ari Cohn, founder and president of the Post Prison Education Program. And again, you can find out more about their work on their Facebook page. Which just search post prison. It's a hyphen there. Post prison education program, and your uh, fabulous new uh, website is post prison edu dot org. You can just Google post prison education program. The first link that comes up is us. You can. <laughs>